One of my students, not very long ago, had to listen to a series of lectures, and when he came out of it, had some very definite ideas, then ran on to a bit of a poem, which he thought expressed those attitudes of his, and that poem is called Two Speakers, and I'd like to read it. He says, they may be short of stature, they may be short of gags, they may be short of listeners as the afternoon lags and lags, but wistfully I wonder as I sit there, bored to death, if I'll ever run across one who perchance is short of breath. Well, I hope that doesn't happen this afternoon or in any of the sessions that I have with you because I'm interested in the problems of human communication. That is the business of man talking to man, whether it is in a formal situation or over the luncheon table or in the busy confines of our daily activities. I'm interested in the kinds of things that happen when people talk together. In short, I'm interested in communication in the broadest possible sense. Now, the moment one mentions the word communication, a host of problems arise. For example, they range all the way from the very simple problems of clarity to some of the most sophisticated problems we can think about. I'm told of a, a story of a man who went to a downtown Washington hotel, and as he was paying his bill, he noticed behind the cashier's cage this little sign. It said, in order to substantiate our desire to accommodate our guests, we would appreciate your cooperation to anticipate your credit requirements before departure. He asked the young lady in the cage what that meant, and she turned and said, positively, no checks cashed. Well, problems of clarity are very interesting. We, we ought to be able to learn to say what we have to say very simply and easily and clearly. Anybody who's ever worked on an income tax return, I think, knows the kind of thing I'm thinking about. If only they would say it in words that we would have a little bit less trouble with. And sometimes, as we study problems of clarity, they work in reverse. Sometimes, when you use very small words, you get into more trouble than if you use very big words. For example, Gertrude Stein once wrote a very small word portrait of a woman, Florence Decote. And as I read this, please note that she's speaking almost invariably or writing in words, very small words. There are some that are two syllables, but they're everyday words. And I'd like to ask you whether you see what she's after. This is about a woman. Never to be restless, never to be afraid, Never to ask will they come, never to have made, never to like having had, little that is left then, she made it do, one and two, thank her for everything. Now I have trouble discovering exactly what Gertrude Stein was saying. But if this be translated into larger words, that is the words of many syllables, suddenly something is communicated. May I read it in a more sophisticated statement? Florence Descartes was a balanced, reconciled and courageous person. She didn't harass herself and others with trifles. She never thought the thing done perfect, nor did she seek possession. She was content with the residue of experience, great or little. She commands our gratitude. Now, it seems to me I get something from the longer statement that I didn't get from the one which used small words. And in our studies of communication, we're very much interested in knowing under what circumstances is simplicity useful, under what circumstances is complexity useful. And then, of course, you can run from problems of clarity to matters having to do with the choice of words. Uh, you, re you notice how easy it is sometimes to choose a word to say something which doesn't convey what you intended. A lady wrote a letter to the editor of the Cleveland Press some time ago, and she addresses her letter to the editor, in which she, it seems to me, dramatizes the problem I just hinted at. She said, Dear Sir, it's about time somebody put his foot down on dirty newspapers that print indecent language in their columns which go into the homes of respectable men and women with children. I will make, not make matters worse by repeating the word which appeared in bold black print in your issue of November the 12th on page 33 in relation to a dog show. I will only say that it was a harsh short synonym for a girl dog. Now this is not the first time I've seen that nasty word in your paper and if I see it once more, I'm going to get good and mad. Well, now, obviously, the choice of the individual word created reverberations in her, and when that happens, one ought to ask a very interesting question. Is something wrong with her, or is something wrong with the writer? But these are problems that I'll be getting to. Then sometimes the problems of communication move off into the greater, more difficult problems of misrepresentation and distortion. That is, we live in a period in the world's history when the Cold War is ever with us, when the Propaganda battles are being fought from one end of the year to the other. Paul Porter uh, tells a story that I think gives one small segment of this fairly clearly. He says, during my economic mission to Greece some years ago, the local communist editors 
frequently distorted the purpose and objectives of my mission. I gave them a classic opportunity for misrepresentation one night at a banquet given in my honor in Macedonia. The dinner started late and was garnished with oratory. When I was finally called up to speak, it was past midnight. Since I was tired and sleepy, I made my remarks brief but cordial. It's indeed a pleasure to be here tonight with you good citizens of Greece, I said. You Greeks and we Americans have very much in common. We like to eat, we like to drink, and we like to sit around and talk. Now, the very next day, the communist chief blazed the assertion that I had insulted the Greeks. Ambassador Porter said that we're just like Americans, gluttons, drunkards, and gossipers. Well, is there a defense against that sort of thing? Can we do anything to protect ourselves against conscious misrepresentation? Well, there are some things we can do, but not too many. And what they are, I shall be getting to again in this series. So I'm interested, in short, in the kinds of things that happen between people that produce trouble. What are the things you do, what are the things I do, which tend to promote friction, tension, conflict, confusion, misunderstanding between us? And these are some of the things that I should like to explore. Now let me begin, if I may, by exploring them from a slightly different point of view. If I can give you some indication of the magnitude of one kind of problem in a slightly larger context. In the 1941, Sir Norman Angel, the great British economist and educator, wrote an essay called Education in the Present Crisis. And I'd like to read two paragraphs which will put my interest in a very larger context. I'm reading from what he says. If the world has nearly destroyed itself, it is not from lack of knowledge in the sense that we lack the knowledge to cure cancer, but it is due to the fact that the mass of men have not applied to public policy knowledge which they already possess, which is indeed of almost universal possession, deducible from the facts of everyday life. He goes on. If this is true, then no education which consists mainly in the dissemination of knowledge can save us. If men can disregard in their policies the facts they already know, they can just as easily disregard new facts which they do not at present know. What is needed is this. The development in men of that particular type of skill which will enable them to make social use of knowledge already in their possession, enable them to apply simple, sometimes self-evident truth to the guidance of their common life. Now may I put what Sir Norman is, is saying in my own words. Certainly in the last hundred years, it's a truism to say that the boundaries of what we know keep getting pushed further and further back. We know more and more about more and more. Take a hundred people in business or professional activities, and they will be far more specialized. They will know more and more. Uh, about a greater number of things in comparison with their predecessor 50 to 75 years ago. That is, the range of what we know keeps getting pushed further and further. Now, I know very few people who would say, we know enough, let's quit, let's stop the advancing front of time, let's quit the research we're doing, let's rest on our laurels. I know very few. Think, for example, what we wouldn't give to know what causes those cells to proliferate into cancer. Think what we wouldn't give at this moment to know why the boy down the street gets polio and, and the girl neighbor next door doesn't, and why one is desperately injured and the other isn't. We'd give a great deal, and there are, as a matter of fact, I know of no area where people have already said, let's rest content, we know enough, let's proceed to, to stop. But about 30 odd years ago, a man by the name of Alfred Korzybski, K-O-R-Z-Y-B-S-K-I, whose name isn't too well known, uh, a man who has had very little academic recognition, who has had very little to do with any of our existing universities, colleges, and so on. But he had a slightly different but interesting idea. This is what he thought. What is there, he said, in the far reaches of a university library? What is there that our professors of anthropology and zoology can agree on? What is there in this vast, tremendous intellectual creation that we've produced? What is there that we all know together? Are there any ideas, simple, complicated, that everybody can agree on? And then he asked another question. If we could find those ideas, he said, is it possible that the neglect of this common wisdom, is it possible that this distillate from all the areas that we know, when neglected, leads to trouble? That is to say, if you and I can agree, no matter how specialized you are or how specialized I am, on what we know in common, then is it possible that if I don't pay attention to that common wisdom, if I lose it, that maybe that's the place to look for the source of tension and conflict and confusion in our everyday talking. And then Korzybski asked a simpler question. It was this. 
Can we find this common wisdom, this common distillate? And when we do, is it at all possible that we can put it in words of one syllable so we can teach it to our children or we can teach it in the grave? And whether or not he succeeded in this great mission of his, of finding what we all ought to know together, and whether or not that is responsible, the neglect is responsible for the tension, is a matter that I should be trying to tell you about in these sessions. And whether or not I can say it in words that are simple enough so that we can teach these great big ideas to our youngsters is also something that I think you'll be able to te test better than I. Now may I begin uh, by my, again, approaching this problem of how to talk sense by asking you very quickly for a moment or two to think about a, a diagram that I'd like to draw on the board. That is, I've, I've drawn it, and uh, if you would look at it very briefly, what I think I've drawn is, is this. <clears throat> I've tried to ask this question. Whenever anybody behaves, regardless of the nature, regardless of the situation, what are the phases through which his actions go? What are the smallest units into which I can break up his big action without losing a sense of continuity? Now, let's take something very simple. Perhaps a fire were to break out in the studio or down the street. Let me call that a happening or an event or a stimulus or say a small kitten were to uh, suddenly come into this room and, and get on top of my rostrum. That would be a happening. Then, if you or I were in the presence of the happening, it would make some impact on us. I would see it or hear it. It would affect my nervous system. And if I were in full possession of all of my faculties, it would make some, as we say, neurological impact. I would know about it. But that isn't all I would do. Something else would happen. I would proceed to evaluate. That is, I would size up this situation. I'd think about it. I'd interpret it. I'd wonder about it somehow. In other words, I would evaluate it and Evaluation being a complicated thing, a lot of things would go on. I would see it, hear it, smell it, and interpret it. I would make some assumptions. I would assume something about this, and I might feel somehow. Thus, if the kitten came in, I, I would see it, and uh, I might assume that this is a very pleasant interruption, a very pleasant way of adding a little drama to what might not be so dramatic, and I might feel pleasant. Or I might assume that somebody didn't do his job well, in which case I would feel angry. In other words, I would see, assume, and feel, and evaluate the situation. Then, I might talk and or act. Now, I suppose if flames broke out in, this, in the room that I'm in at this moment, I suppose uh, I might say to somebody, what do we do about it? Or let's get out of here. Or look, uh, isn't someone going to do anything think about it? Or I might act. In other words, I just depart from these surroundings very quickly. Or I might proceed to perhaps to go over and try to stamp it out. Now then, it is my basic premise that these four things happen with almost every bit of human behavior. Now, I'm a, I admit that there are some occasions when phase three doesn't seem to exist. For example, if you shoot a pinpoint of light in my eye, uh, that's a happening. It'll make an impact on my pupil but I don't think I'll do much evaluating, my pupil will close. Or I think if perhaps if you were suddenly to jab me with a pin, I would, that would be the happening. It would make an impact. I would probably feel it, but I don't think I'd do any thinking about it except to uh, jump or yell or run away or ask you to stop. So that I want to suggest that for the great important moments of human behavior, and even for the unimportant moments of human behavior, these four things happen. That's my first premise and the first thing I'd like to ask you to think about. And something on which we can get a great deal of agreement right around the university curriculum. But I'll come back to that in a minute. I now want to make my second point, which is this. We ought to be able to distinguish between our evaluations of situations, A, which make sense, are sensible, are mature, intelligent, wise, and those which are not so intelligent, not so wise, bluntly, are those which are stupid. Or we ought to be able to distinguish between, I imagine you can think that there are some things I might do if flames broke out into this room, which would be sensible. There are some things I might do which would not be sensible. And it is the thesis 
or it is the basic position or theory of the students of general semantics that every bit of human behavior, every bit of it, ought to be analyzable or distinguished into these two great categories. Some talking makes sense, some talking does not make sense. Well, I'd like just to give you a couple of quick illustrations of what I'm after. Dr. Eugene Hartley wrote a book called Problems in Prejudice and made a study of the attitudes of 800 graduating seniors at a number of Eastern colleges and universities of their attitudes towards minority groups. Now, what he did was give them a very simple form of a very widely known test used in sociology, nothing but a sheet of paper, on which he had the, the names of 20, oh, 30 or 40 minority groups, Mexicans, Hungarians, Poles, Italians, Presbyterians, and so on. And they were listed down one side. Then there were a series of columns divided as follows. I would not like to have these people enter the country, live in my town, uh, live on my block, join my country club, come to my house for dinner, go out on a date with Mary. That is, if your attitude towards, for example, Presbyterians was well enough defined, you'd put an X in the appropriate box. Now, I'm not sure that this is a very sharp test of human attitudes, but it will give you indications if you try it out on a great number. Now, when Hartley did this, uh, this test was originally devised by Professor Bogartis, the distinguished sociologist. When he did this, he included in the names of minority groups the names of three entirely imaginary minority groups, the Pyrenians, the Danierians, and the Wallonians. And he found that on the average, there was just as much prejudice directed against these wholly imaginary groups as against any other on the list. And I like his conclusion. He says, and so it seems reasonable to conclude that the behavior of the Pyrenians, the Wallonians, and the Danarians didn't have very much to do with the prejudice that was directed against them. Now, please observe. A group of graduating seniors in our, at the university level were presented with a piece of paper and some names on it. They read it. It made an impact. They made some assumptions about it. They felt somehow, and they proceeded to reply, saying that they disliked these imaginary people. Now, something seems wrong about that to me. That looks like a mis-evaluation. It looks as though they did something that was strange and quaint and awry. My problem is, how can I talk about that so as to prevent that kind of not entirely sensible behavior from happening again? Think of another uh, very simple kind of uh, situation that, that I ran across. This is a test by two other uh, psychologists. Miller and Bugelski, they tell that 31 young men at a camp, this was before the outbreak of World War II, they were asked to rate Japanese and Mexicans on a pencil and paper test. Immediately after they did, the men were exposed to a frustrating experience. The men were not allowed to go to the camp theater as they had expected, but they were told they would be required to work in the camp instead. Then after they were told that, they were given these rating sheets, and the results showed a marked diminution in the number of favorable traits and an increase in the number of unfavorable traits ascribed to the two groups. So something seems wrong about that to me. That is, here were men responding to minority people. And they were responding to it in a very interesting way the second time in comparison to the first. How can I talk about that so that I shall perhaps clarify or keep us from that sort of behavior. One other uh, a quick illustration of what I'm after, I suppose, can be given in terms of animal behavior. There's an experiment that it would be very interesting to perform, but it, sometimes it, it doesn't work as sharply as I shall tell you about it. It consists in taking a galvanized container, metal container, about so, about so high, and filling it with water. And the galvanized container contains some notches so that we can put a glass partition uh, right almost in the middle. Now this requires that we find a walleye pike or a northern pike. Doesn't make much difference, but we ought to have a hungry one if we can possibly find it. And uh, we put him over here and let him swim around. Then on this side of the container, we take a handful of minnows, the walleye pike's favorite food. We just dump them in and uh, let them swim around freely. Now if you will stand off in a situation like this, you'll notice that the pike goes after the minnows. That is, you, you'll hear a swish and a dull thud. And uh, the pike will bump up against the glass and then bounce back and do it again. And we'll keep on doing that. 
you stand off with a clocker and count it. Now, this is no place to get into any controversy, but if the fish, it makes a difference. Whether the fish comes from northern Wisconsin or northern Michigan or somewhere else, as to how long it will, how many tries it will take until the fish quits. There are those who say that it takes a little longer if the fish comes from northern Michigan, but I won't uh, fight that out. Nevertheless, there will come a time when the fish will stop. That is, he's learned if you go after these fish, you, uh, you get bumped and you don't catch the minnows. At that point, when he swims lazily all by himself, the experimenter removes the glass partition and the minnows proceed to swim freely, almost coming up against the pike and some of them bang against his gills. But he knows what he knows. He knows that you don't go after those. And in the midst of plenty, he proceeds uh, to starve, literally. And if you wait long enough, he, he will die in the midst of all these minnows. Somehow or other, in the presence of the happening, which made an impact, if we can think that the fish evaluates, thinks, interprets in his own way, and then proceeds to act, there's something about his behavior that isn't quite sensible. His behavior leaves something to be desired. There's something off. It's awry. Now, how can we describe the pattern of that behavior? How can one describe what happened to the pike? And I have a hunch that you can almost at this moment think of illustrations yourself in which human beings behave like that. And when they do, in their talking and acting, we begin to have a pattern of the difficulties that they get into. So I'm very much interested in a, a very interesting question, since I used an illustration of, of an animal, of a, a way of saying or stating the difference between human beings and animals. Now, there are many respects in which I am very much like fish, in which we are, in our human beings, are very much like animals. Thus, for example, animals need uh, plants in the field. Animals use other animals for food and energy. We do, too. The only sources of energy that we can get hold of are plants and other animals. Animals move around. They jump, run, gamble, fight, procreate, do all the things moving around that uh, you can imagine. So do human beings. We do almost all of the things, uh, perhaps not as well in some respects, in some respects others. We move around. But there is one thing a human being can do that, so far as I know, an animal can't do. And that is, a human being can build on, summarize, use, and digest the labor and experience of the past. So far as I know, an animal, let's take an example, a, a robin or a, a beaver or a bee proceeds, a bee proceeds to build and produce honey exactly as countless generations before. A robin builds a nest pretty much as robins have built them before. That is, so far as we know, there doesn't seem to be progress in the world of, of animal life. However, among human beings, you find improvement. This TV began, I suppose, it had its beginnings with Raymer, who checked the movement, the, the time it took planets to revolve in the sky, building on what he found uh, a, a Clark Maxwell, picking up where Clark Maxwell left off Marconi, De Forest, and so on, right down to this uh, magnificent achievement. Human beings can pick up where others leave off. Now, why can we do that? Why can't you and I pick up where others leave off? Because they can write it down, and we can begin to interpret it. That is, it is this symbolizing capacity. It is our capacity to use words, language, symbols, to write what we have found down, which allows succeeding generations to pick up precisely where we left off. And thus, we can proceed to add. I'm interested in this question. Why is it that sometimes human beings don't build on the experience of the past? Is it possible that in our talking and acting and in our evaluating, we can get some clues as to why people don't build on experience? Is it possible that we can explain why the fish perhaps ought to die if you behave this way? And it, it is this search for the means of symbolizing and talking and evaluating that we may discover how not to behave like the animal. A drunkard. I suppose, is a, from one point of view, is a man who behaves just like the animal. He's a consumer. He never produces. He never builds on the experience of the past. He's a destroyer, almost entirely. 
And for human beings to live a life of consumption and destruction only is ultimately to be self-defeating. I can say this perhaps in another way. If animals engage in destruction, conflict, fighting among themselves, I'm almost willing to take that as take that for granted. That's all right with me. But when human beings do that, when human beings misunderstand each other, develop prejudices against non-existing people, then tensions and difficulties are inevitable. Can anything be done to prevent those tensions and conflicts and confusions and misunderstanding? That's what I now should like to do in the succeeding sessions uh, in these talks that I should like to give. Now, as a way of preparing us for, in order to plunge right into the, the lessons that I'm interested in, I'm going to ask first whether we all know how to make a statement of fact. Now, I picked this up at the grocery store on, on the way in. The ordinary apple, the kind of thing that I suppose uh, I, I haven't tampered with it. Here it is. Suppose I say, or suppose you say, there are seeds in this apple. Suppose you did the same thing in your icebox or pantry. You brought an apple, and you were to say there are seeds in this apple. The question I want to ask is, are you talking factually? Did you make a statement of fact? How you answer the question is, I shall take as my starting point to go on the study of proper evaluation. If you say that is a statement of fact, then I shall understand that you have very interesting patterns of evaluation which may or may not get us into trouble. If you say that is not a statement of fact, I shall ask you, do you know what kind of statement that is? And if you do not answer in the terms that I shall describe, I shall not be surprised if trouble comes. 